I think and praise God for this time he has given us, even though we're on Zoom. And uh, I remember uh, discussing with uh, some brothers on Friday night about going going back to Zoom and everyone's like, oh, here we go again. So uh, here we are and God is, God is good, God is great. And that is the theme behind this Psalm. Uh, this is a Psalm of David. Uh, David is magnifying and praising the greatness and the goodness of God. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, we have to be reminded in this season. I just wanted to, I'm not going to take much time, just share a couple of thoughts that have been on my mind from this Psalm. Uh, when you look at the Psalm, the 21 verses of this Psalm, everything is about the unsearchable, some transla translations say unfathomable greatness of God and the goodness of God. And, you know, in 2022, I mean, the, the simple fact that you and I are alive to see 2022 um, is just because of the greatness and the goodness of God uh, in our life. I mean, we live in a world of constant upheaval. Um, I, you know, I, I used to be the guy, you know, I think you guys have heard this, uh, before with other people. I used to watch the news. There's no point of watching the news anymore because the news is just constantly from one thing to the next thing. Um, and obviously none of that is good. We, we're in a world of just constant turmoil. Um, yesterday, there was a underwater volcano that was so explosive that it caused a tsunami all the way to California. And there is rumors of wars, Russia invading Ukraine. And of course, we have the whole pandemic situation in, in the background and, you know, the hospital systems, the, you know, everyone's short staffed, everyone's patience is, is going dry. And so, you know, one thing I wanted to remind us before I dive into this psalm, this, this psalm is about David's vision of God's greatness and goodness you know, and in this season of our life, and it seems like a really long season, this season of our life, there are two things that we as a church, we as families, we as believers are battling. Number one is anxiety, of course, and we've heard many messages on anxiety, what anxiety does to us. And the second word um, that I want you to keep in your memory today is apathy, A-P-A-T-H-Y, apathy, which means lack of interest enthusiasm, lack of concern. You know, we heard last night about the, the life of Elijah, you know, the book of James. James says, Elijah was a man just like us. If you look at the life of Elijah, man, he suffered, you know, he was a great man of God. He brought fire down from heaven, but he suffered with despair, unbelief at points, weakness, loneliness, Periods of anxiety that were so paralyzing, so debilitating. Um, and that's what anxiety does. Anxiety robs you of joy. It robs us of all peace. It, it takes us, you know, so far away from God. And, but we all deal with it at varying degrees. You know, Psalm 145 shows us that God sustains and satisfies every living thing. That's what, when you read verse 14 through 16, the Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. Whether you fall or you're bowed down, the Lord upholds you. The Lord raises you up. The eyes of all, everything, look expectantly to you because you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So dear church, dear, dear children of God, dear parents, dear children, we can rest in God's care because God still delights to pour his glory into us, us weak vessels of clay. So don't, don't worry about what's happening to you. Maybe there's a lot happening to you. Maybe there's a lot of reasons to be anxious, but it's not about what is happening to us, but it's rather what God is doing through us for his glory. That's anxiety. How about apathy? Psalm 145 addresses this issue as well. You know, this is, this is a problem we as Christians face right now more than ever. Um, you know, when, when we're jumping from Zoom service to in-person, then back to Zoom, sometimes we get lulled into the sense of being too familiar. We get bored. We lose interest, you know. 
because we're so we're constantly surrounded by religious things many times we lose our awe and wonder of who god is and there's nothing more dangerous that can happen to a believer there's nothing more dangerous than what can happen to a christian if you lose your awe and wonder of god if you don't sense have a sense of wonderment a sense of awe of who god is then it negatively impacts the rest of your life. Because we were created for wonder and worship. But when you have apathy, when you lose interest in worship, you lose interest in God. And you lose interest in understanding who God is. But we were hardwired to worship. So instead of worshiping God, when you lose in interest in God, you start to worship other things other than God. And as a result, you start to see relationship stuff suffer. You start to see idolatry. We start to worship other things. You start to spend money wrong. You drift into the other things of this world. Because we're so hardwired to worship, when our worship drifts off of God, we worship other things. This is why when you look at this psalm, and not just this psalm, look in the entirety of the psalms, David's constant repetition is his worship of God. So you look at verse one and he sets the tone. I will worship you. I will praise you. Some translations say, I will extol you, my king and my God, and bless your name forever and ever. Verse two, every day I will praise you and worship your name forever and ever. This is a common line of David. Look throughout the Psalm, Psalm 34, very common verse. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Not just on Sundays, not just when it's corporate worship time, not just on watch night service, not just family prayer. You praise him when you are sick. You praise him when you lose out on that job opportunity. You praise him when your world seems upside down. Why? And he answers that in verse three. Because great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. His greatness no one can fathom. When you praise God, you are declaring to the world that there is no problem greater than the greatness of God. Many times we are overwhelmed by the situations in the world because we've kind of lost touch with God and our worship of God. When you worship God, you realize, when you praise God, you realize how great God is. And the problems of this world don't seem so great. Notice in verse, verses one and two of this Psalm, the emphasis is I will. So praise is an act of the will. We have to decide that. Because if you don't decide that, what will happen is you'll decide to worship other things. Like I said, we were created to worship God. You and I will, if we don't praise God, you will praise something. So it's very important that we make it a habit every day, not just a Sunday thing, not just when we come together, that we are praising God. You know, verse three says, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, his greatness. And that, that word great is just emphasized multiple times in that verse. The word great is, in, you know, a, ver, a word that is just used so often in our society today. You know, now we have the term, uh, you know, greatest of all time it is a common usage that we hear. We use that, we use the word great for everything. It's such a common term. We had a great burger. It was the greatest. Great city, New York City is the greatest. I don't know who says that, but people say that. And some athletes are the greatest. Some people have even used the term Alexander the Great. But when you use the word great, it always changes. You know, that burger that you thought that was great last week, this week you eat a new burger and all of a sudden it's greater. Last week you thought New York City was great. This week you go to Chicago and you realize it's a great city. You know, greatness changes constantly. You know, all humans, you know, display some level of greatness, but that pales in comparison to the greatness of God. And we always sing that song, oh God, how great thou art. David is saying, when you praise God daily, 
When the praises of God are continually in your mouth, you will realize the unsearchable greatness of God. It is something we can't even wrap our head around. But let me tell you something, church. You don't have to be in church to feel the presence of God, the greatness of, of his presence. You know, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities. I'm reading from Romans 1, 20. The, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being seen in what? Being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So when you step outside into the night sky, you look at that vast sky, you see the greatness of God. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So every corner of the globe you, you look, you see the greatness of God. Psalm 95 verses 3 through 5, for the Lord is a great God. This is, this is one of the Psalms where David is talking about the, he is the great king above all gods. And then he goes and talks about the greatness of God in creation. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. But the greatness of God is not just in the sky. It's not just in nature. The greatness of God is not just in the beauty of creation. Yes, we can see the greatness of God in the stars, but you see the greatness of God in his approach to humanity. What did Paul say in Romans? In everything, we, in everything that God created, we see his divine nature and his power. That includes us as humans. David reflects on the greatness of God. If you look out throughout the Psalms, but Psalm 8, very familiar Psalm to us, Psalm 8, verses 3 through 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or human beings that you care for them? David says, I look at the stars, I see the grandness of the sky. And then I look at humans who return to dust. What is man? You've created all of this beauty, God. But what is man that you should even care for them? If you want to see the pathetic condition of humanity, if you want to see how great God is to even consider humans, just step into the floor of an ICU. And you will see humans who are once talented, gifted, strong, able-bodied. But now just to keep them alive, they have wires and tubes coming out of all, uh, everywhere. Three, four medications just to keep their heart beating. Psalm 8 says, in continuation of what David said, you have made humans a little lower than the angels, but you have crowned them with glory and honor. See, the unsearchable greatness of God is that he decided to redeem humanity even after our sin and our shame. He gave his only begotten son to give all of humanity a chance at, redemp at redemption. Paul said it, I think Paul said it best in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Because of his great love, I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Because of his great love, there's that word great again. One of the divine nature, divine characteristics of God. Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgression. And it is by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. You see, children of God, we had no worthiness to be redeemed. When you go through anxieties in this life, when you face apathy in your life, when you start to lose interest in the things of God, realize that you and I had no worthiness to be redeemed. But God decided that he was going to send his son because of his great love and his being rich in mercy so we can sit with him in the heavenly realms. Verse 4. Let me move quickly here. Verse 4. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and meditate on your wonderful works. When I read this verse, one generation commends your works to another. I'm reminded of another verse from the Psalm, Psalm 78 verse 4, where it says there, we will not hide them from their generation, 
from their descendants. We will tell the next generation. It reminds us of our responsibility. And I, and I just a few months ago, I, I have already spoken about legacy and, and the importance of the next passing along the things of God to the next generation. So I don't want to go too deep into that. But this is our responsibility to pass on the works of God, the, the wonders of God, the majesty of God to the next generation. You know, I was, I was reading the yearly reports submitted by each department. And I was looking in the Sunday school department. And I noticed we've got about 20 Sunday school students right now. You know, those 20, we pay account to. We as a church, we as families, we as individuals. That is the next generation. You see, God doesn't drop a new Bible from heaven for, for each new generation. There's no new, there's new, no, nothing new coming. It is the same Bible. He intends that the older generation will teach the newer generation to read, to trust, to obey, to rejoice. Don't get me wrong. I believe God deals with each generation personally because we have challenges that are unique that the previous generation didn't face. But it's through the same biblical principles that has come through each generation. This Bible that you and I are holding is the same biblical truths from the New Testament church that the New Testament church was built on. It is the same Bible that our grandparents and our parents held. So it is the biblical duty of every generation of believers that the next generation hears about the mighty acts of God. Dear church, even if we don't pack the sanctuary with the capacity people, our prayer our focus, our desire, our joy is to see the next generation walk in the truth. But how does that happen? David tells us in this psalm how that happens. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. This is verse 5. And they shall speak of the mighty might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. When we talk about God to the next generation, it's not just passing information. See what, the, see what he says in verse four. One generation shall praise your works to another. Or some translations, it says, one generation shall commend your works to another. This is not just commitment, guys. This is a love for the truth. This is not just transferring information. It is a demonstration of adoration. So in other words, the next generation has to see their parents, their teachers, praise God with the passion. They have to see worship that is lived out. Parents, if you want to see your kids walk in the truth, you better have that walk mastered yourself. Our teaching should always be infused with passion and zeal for the king. Otherwise, there's going to be a huge disconnect. Our words say one thing, but our actions and our emotions say another thing. And so the primary, primary responsibility of training the next generation comes to the parents. You know, we read Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew all the time, the Great Commission, making disciples. But it starts, making disciples starts with the next generation first. We can't go outside to the rest of the world when our own children are not disciples first. So parents, we have to wake up, dear believers, dear church, we have to wake up to the fact that for our next generation to be disciples, we first must be disciples. Verse 8 and 9 talks about the divine nature of God, and I, I don't want to get into that. We've, we've heard many messages in this church about the divine nature of God. Lord is gracious, he's compassionate, he's slow to anger. When the most Commonly quoted verses in the Bible, you look from Genesis to Revelation, it talks about the Lord's divine nature in his compassion, his slowness to anger, and his richness in love. The Lord is good to all, and he has compassion on everything he has made. Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. This is the unsearchable greatness of God, dear children. He upholds everyone who falls. He upholds everyone who is bowed down. 
Think about that. Why are you bowing down? Why do people bow down? Sometimes it's shame. Do you have failure in your life? Do you have sin in your life? Because that's what the devil wants you to do. The devil wants to trap you in sin so that now your head is bowed down in shame. But David says, if you come back to him, if you call back to him in truth, the Lord is near. That's what we read in the, the next coming verses. The Lord upholds all who fall. But come down to verse 18. The Lord is near to all those who call upon him in truth. And then you look at verse 21. The psalmist concludes with this logical response to God's goodness. God's sovereignty, God's grace, and that is praise. So David ends this psalm the way he began it with a commitment to praise the Lord. Verse 21, my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. And that's my prayer to you. That's in my, my short thought that I wanted to pass to you this morning. As we consider this psalm that was read to us, may this psalm confront your anxiety, may it confront your apathy, and hopefully it ignites peace and wonder on the greatness of God. May God bless you with these words.